afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us on the Patient Registrations webinar for GP Practices. My name is Debbie Roberts and I work in the PCC Communications team and I will be facilitating this afternoon's session. So just having a quick look at today's agenda then. So before we do make a start, I will just run through some quick introductions so you know who we've got presenting on the call today and who we've got working in the background supporting with the Q&A. And then we're going to start off looking at registering patients at the practice and then we're going to jump on to rejected registration so having a look at what they are and how you can stop those coming through we'll then touch on gms3 forms for our temporary residents so what the form is and how you get the form and how you submit it to pcse we'll then delve into confusions and duplicated nhs numbers before moving on to gender reassignments We'll then quickly look at adoptions and patient removals, and then we'll look at areas such as interchange management, list reconciliation, list maintenance, and then we'll end with queries and questions. OK, so just to let you know who we do have on the call today. So I've already introduced myself, so I work in the communication team and my name is Debbie Roberts and supporting me in the background is my colleague Kat. And knowledge from the registrations teams, we've got Sarah, Jamie, Alex, Joe and Sarah. OK, so we're going to start the presentation by just having a quick look at registering patients then and how you can ensure that when you are registering your patient, it goes as smoothly as possible. Now, at PCSE, we are responsible for processing new patient registrations. Now, that also includes amendments to existing patients and deduction requests, and they're all submitted by practices via GP links. Now, we ensure that the personal demographic service, more commonly known as the spine by practices, reflects what is held on the practices clinical systems. Now, PCC will never change a record as deceased without us actually being notified of this. So unless the practice notify us, then we won't be able to change anything on there. Now, however, if a patient is marked as formerly deceased on PDS spine, then you will receive a deduction which is sent by spine via GP links. So to ensure a smooth registration, we do advise the following that patient details are correctly entered into the clinical system. So this includes things like making sure that you've got the birthplace in there, making sure you've got the home address included, including postcodes and any previous home addresses. And again, if you can include the postcodes from the previous address, that would be really helpful. And including things like previous names and any previous GP practice details that you've got for the patient. So when searching for a patient, just make sure that your smart card is inserted and double check that you've selected the correct patient. Use the exact details that the patient provides you, because sometimes we do find that some people's names are very familiar and they sound the same or they could be spelt similar. So just make sure that you do enter the exact details that you are given by the patient. We also recommend that the free text area and the additional notes field isn't always used. Now, it's not mandatory and text entered in this field can stop a registration going through efficiently. So only use the free text area if you have any information that would support and assist in tracing a patient or if you're registering a patient under choice of GP where your practice agreed to maintain the patient on your list but are not providing home visits. So for patients joining from a home nation, the registration type selected on the clinical system for these types of patients should be the same as though the patient was moving from a practice in England. So just to touch on registering patients from home nations then. So if a patient was registered with the NHS in Scotland or Northern Ireland and they're now registering with your practice in England, they will be allocated a new NHS number. Now, Having said that, if National Back Office do trace the Northern Ireland NHS number, then you will receive an NHS number amendment down the link. So for patients registering in England for the first time, having previously been registered in Scotland or Northern Ireland, just select the registration type on your clinical system that you would if the patient was registering from another area within England and just try and include their previous address. Now, with regards to the previous address, we just ask that you do include the previous address 
that was in Scotland or Northern Ireland. We do see some occasions that the practice think it needs to be the last registered English address, but that's not the case. So if they have been previously registered in Scotland, just make sure that you do include that as the, the previous address. This will just ensure that PCSE have all the information necessary to accept the registration and then we can initiate the process to move the medical record from that patient's previous practice. OK, so I just wanted to show you this diagram then. So this is basically what happens with the medical record when a patient registers or deregisters from a practice. Now, for a medical record to move, the process starts at the new GP practice. So when the patient is registered, now, PCSE are notified of the new registration, and that's when a transit label is printed, which is then sent to the deducting practice. Now, once the label has been received, the deducting practice needs to affix the transit label onto the polylope bag and include the relevant medical record within that bag. City Sprint will then collect the record on the practice's next available collection day, which is usually the same time every week. Now, once the record has been collected from the deducting practice, the record will be transported and then delivered to the new practice. Now, having said that, as you can see on here, it does show the GP links file transfer. Some records will need to be sent to and from your practice electronically. However, some will need to be sent manually. So the GP links won't work if you've got a patient that's registering from a home nation. It will need to be a physical record movement um, that will be required. Now, you can usually identify that by the label that's come through to the practice. I think it, it just has like a three code number letter on there. So it'll say SCO for Scotland and things like that. So that's usually how you do identify if you do need to print the record and then send it off manually with your city's print delivery. OK, so that was just a little bit on registering patients then. I'm now going to hand over to Jo that's going to touch on rejected registrations and what we can do to ensure the practice don't receive those. So would you be so kind in just explaining what a rejected registration is, please? So a rejection is what happens when a patient registration is sent from the practice clinical system to PCSE and there's either a data quality issue or PCSE require additional information in order to accept the registration. So because of this, um, PCSE, PCSE are responsible for ensuring that patients are registered with their correct and only NHS number and that their details are correct, including date of birth, gender and address, importantly. So if PCSE are unable to trace the patient on the spine or the PDS with the information provided or there may be doubts on whether a potential trace is found or indeed correct for the patient, then the attempted registration may be rejected for further information or clarification. If there is a query over date on the registration or patient's record on spine, again, PCSE may need to reject the registration to clarify the details to make sure we got the right patient. Thanks, Joe. So why do PCSE need the data to be accurate once the patient's been registered? So, PCSE need it to be accurate because we need it to be the latest information, more importantly, as historic information can be confused with whatever the latest information is. And then the data held on spine is used for various national health screening programs to determine eligibility and invites um, patients to screening appointments. So very indicative that we get like addresses correct, for example. So letters can be sent to the correct addresses. And the spine data is also used as source to calculate the quarterly sum payments, global sum payments. And if the information is not correct for patients, maybe put at clinical risk and that the practice not receiving the global sum payments based on their registered population. Um, as a result, rejected registrations may be resubmitted as soon as possible. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Okay. So what if a practice receive a, re a rejected registration? What do they need to do? So when a registration is rejected by PCC, a transaction will be received into the clinical system mm -hmm. for the practice. And it will be accompanied by some free text informing the practice admin staff of the next steps. If the free text indicates an email, email will be sent. This will be sent to the main contact that we have listed for the practice by the following day. An email template is used for each unique code that's provided on the rejection message that you'll be receiving on the clinical system. If an email is not received, there is a document on the PCSE website that provides general information as to what the code means and what information is required. 
If PCSE are requesting further information, this should be obtained as quickly as possible and the registration resubmitted through the GP links to reduce potential delays in patient care. Thanks for that, Joe. So with regards to the rejection codes, I just wanted to put something on there visually so you can actually see the practice where you can access a sheet that's got all the information on. Now, when you visit the PCSE website, um, what you need to do is just head, or head over to resources. As you can see, I've highlighted it in green there, just in the top of the banner, in the blue banner. And then if you click patient registration resources, as you can see where I've highlighted it there as well. Once you click into there, you'll see the option to download an Excel spreadsheet where I've highlighted in green where it says rejection codes. Now, you'll get something that looks like this. So it basically shows you the rejection code. It'll give you the rejection reason. And it'll also show you the GP links reject text. And then it'll also provide some additional information on what the rejection means and how you can rectify it. I'm not going to talk through all these with you because I appreciate there's a lot of information on there. But I just wanted to show you that that's exactly what you'll get if you visit the website and then download that. So it might be helpful, if, you know, if you do have a practice that has received a rejected registration and you're not quite sure what to do with it or what the code means, there is information available on the PCSE website. OK, so Joe, why do practices receive multiple emails about a rejected registration? So NHS England requests that PCSE chase rejected registrations after five working days, and this is due to the potential clinical impacts of the patient if we haven't got the correct or up-to-date information. Um, tracking of resubmitted registrations based on whether the original registration contained an NHS number, so it can be linked. Where it doesn't contain an NHS number, PCSE cannot track the resubmission, therefore a reminder will be sent regardless as a default. If you believe the registration has already been resubmitted, and the acceptance and approval has been received, then you can just ignore that email. Right, thank you. And is there anything that at practices, can they do anything to avoid a rejected registration? So probably the most important is just ensuring that all the patient information is just accurate and correct with the following of checking addresses complete, um, particularly if there's flat a number of apartment numbers if required. Make sure that any out of area registrations are sent with the correct free text for out of area patients and to avoid a rejected registration from home nation is important at the point of the registration, which we mentioned earlier, that the correct registration type is used and failure to use the correct code will prompt for the correct incorrect details to be included in the clinical system resulting in a rejected registration. And lastly, if the spine picks up the same address as the current address, you'll need to edit and update with the information provided by the patient. Lovely. Thanks, Joe. So I suppose it is just a case of just making sure that all the details are entered correctly when the patient actually registers with the practice. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Cheers, Joe. Thanks for that. I'm now going to quickly touch on GMS3 forms for temporary residents. And all the attendees will be familiar with the GMS3 form and the reason what it's used for. So it is technically used for a patient that needs to get care at the practice, but they're not actually registered with yourself. Now, what we ask is that the form is completed with all the patient's details, including things like details of their illness. And the form can be used for various things, so for telephone advice, if there's any immediate necessary treatment needed, contraceptive services, et cetera, et cetera. That's basically what the form's used for. Now, one of the main queries that we do get at PCSE, and one of the reasons why I wanted to touch on it in the webinar is that people don't know where to get the form from. So, we do have a lot of people that think they can just go on the PCSE website and download the form, but that's not the case. A GMS3 form it will need to be ordered through the supplies page of PCSE online. Now, having said that, not anybody can just go onto PCSE online and order that through the supplies department. You will have to have the practice order entry clerk role in PCSE online to be able to order that form. So, if you're admin staff at the practice and it's your responsibility to manage these forms and you don't have any and you don't have the practice order entry clerk role, just try and find somebody in the practice that is able to order those forms for you so they can come through because you're not able to just simply download them from the PCSE website. Now, I just want to quickly show you the best way that how you can submit these forms. So. Once you've seen the patient and you're happy that the form's complete and you're happy to then send that form to the patient's registered practice. Now, again, 
it's all through PCSE online, so you are going to need the required role. Now, however, so when you are ready to send your GMS3 form to the registered practice, you'll just need to make sure that you've logged into your PCSE online, online account first. And the role that is needed is the practice record movement admin role. Now, at the end of the presentation, I am going to go through PCSE online roles in a little bit more detail, but for this specific area, if you are wanting to submit the GMS3 forms, it is the practice records movement admin role that you are going to need. Now, if you find that you don't have that role and you do need that, you'll need to speak to your user administrator and the user administrator for supplies and medical records is going to be the main contact at the practice. And again, if you don't know who your main contact is, don't worry, I am going to go through that in a bit more detail later on. So once your form is ready and you're ready to send that through, all you need to do is simply scan the form, making sure that you do scan both sides of the form and save that on your PC as a PDF document. Now to name the form, we recommend that you use the patient's full name. And then once you have logged into PCSE online and you've scanned all your form into your PC, if you head over to the medical records section of PCSE online, you'll see the area that I've highlighted in green is where you'll be able to submit your form to PCSE. Now, you'll also see here, this is where you can locate any completed forms that you've received from other practices for patients that might have got some temporary cover elsewhere. And in this example here, you can see that there's currently 16 forms outstanding. Now, what that practice can do is select download forms and then they can then pull the forms down what they need and they can include those forms within their patient records. Now, once you're happy that you've scanned your form through for your patient that you need to send to another practice, you can select the submit GMS3 form. Now, you've got two options here. So you can either drag and drop the actual PDF file into the drag and drop area that I've highlighted in green, or you can select the blue button. I'll just put a highlight on there so you can see it. So there's just a blue button there which says browse. If you click that, then it will pull up your computer's filing system. And then wherever you've saved your file, you'll just be able to include it from that section there. Now, we do appreciate that not everybody or every practice had do have scanning facilities. Um, now, if that is the case, then you can send those forms within your standard City Sprint collection. You'll just need to order some um, labels to be able to return those, which you can just do in this section here that I'm just pointing at now with the, the highlighter. However, using PCC Online to submit your form electronically, it is the most efficient way. As soon as you scan that through, it'll come through to the team at PCSE and then Provided we've got all the information on the form and we can easily read all the details, we can just send that straight to the practice where the person's actually registered. So, but yeah, so I just wanted to quickly touch on that because we do get a lot of queries coming in that people aren't quite sure where to order the form from or what they need to do once it's been completed. We're now moving on to confusions then. So I'm going to link in with Jamie to support me on this one. So would you be so kind just to explain to everybody what we class as a confusion? Uh, yes, certainly. So this is where there are, there's two or more patients information that has been added to the same NHS number or both patients are using the same NHS number. So typically if a patient registers a practice and the wrong NHS number has been picked up, that's a confusion. And if um, the incorrect, say, name or address information gets on another patient's record and it actually relates to a different patient. Again, that is a, a confusion. And when that's updated on the on the PDS or the spine record, that's where PCSE needs to be getting involved. Great. Thanks, Jamie. So but what does it actually mean for a patient then if the record has been confused with another? So when the wrong NHS number is used to register a patient, the movement of medical records is tied to the NHS number. So if, you, if, if a patient did get registered on the number, you would receive the wrong medical record. And that would actually mean that they also get unknowingly deducted from the practice that they expect to be registered with. So I guess in primary care, you'll all have had a situation where a patient presents a practice trying to make an appointment and you say, oh, you're no longer registered. And they say, well, I've never registered anywhere else. That could be indicative of a, a confusion occurring. And then there's a the potential clinical risk to, to screening programmes, because again, kind of the screening programmes are linked to patients' NHS numbers. 
So if a patient is, is due for an appointment and they've been confused, an invite or a result letter may go to the address of another patient. Yeah, so it is quite important then, isn't it? Especially where screening's involved. Absolutely, yes. Thanks, Jamie. So how do we resolve a the confusion then? What's the process for it? Um, so PCSE acts a little bit of a, an information gatherer and a, a liaison for the practice with the National Back Office. Because the National Back Office are the organisation responsible for data quality on the spine. So as I, as I kind of say, is we will get as much information as we can from practices to assure ourselves that we know which NHS number relates to which patient and which demographic details do. And we will then liaise with the National Back Office, ensure that they correct the records, and then we will go back to the practice and discuss any actions that are required to correct clinical system records so they so that it brings the spine PDS in line with what's on the clinical system. Thanks, Jamie. So with regards to timescales then, do we know roughly how long it takes to rectify a confusion? Yes, so when PCSE are notified of a potential confusion, we aim to pick that up within, within 10 working days. If we do need further information, we will go back to the practices as, as soon as we pick up that case. And once we have enough information, we will log it to the, M to the National Back Office. Unfortunately, we don't have any have control over the MBO timescales, so we are kind of uh, slaves to them. But as soon as they do resolve the situation, we'll come back to, to the practice as soon as we can. That's great. So when you say we contact the practice, is it the, the contact email address of the main contact that we'll usually liaise with? Yes. So if it's a, if it's completed by an online form, if we notify an online form, then yes, we will go back to the person who's raised the online form. There will be cases where maybe the National Back Office have identified a confusion from other sources. So a hospital may log one, for example, with the National Back Office and the National Back Office might want more information, in which case PCSE will go to the practice um, and that will go to the main contact. Lovely. Thanks for clarifying, Jamie. So is there anything that we can do to try and avoid any of these common issues? Yes, yeah, so I guess keeping contacts up to date on PCS Online, because if we need to, if we need additional information about a confusion, it's important we have the right information so we're getting the information as quick as possible. Because it contains patient identifiable information, having NHS net emails is preferred because otherwise we'd have to send kind of very secure methods with egress, um, which I know perhaps some practices do have trouble opening up the emails of that. Providing as much information as you can up front, so any previous names, um, recent address history, any previous GP registrations, and that will just allow us to kind of process the, the confusion, hopefully at first attempt, and avoid us having to go back to you and kind of delay the process towards resolution. That's great, Jamie. Thank you. OK, so moving on to duplicate NHS numbers then. So if you could explain what we would actually class as a duplicate in PCSE. Yes, so this is where a patient has two or more NHS numbers and the second or any further ones than that have been allocated to the patient in error. OK, and so what does it mean for a patient then if they've got two NHS numbers in error? So effectively, again, as we kind of touched on, the medical records are connected to NHS numbers. So if you have two NHS numbers, you could have multiple medical records in different locations, which doesn't necessarily mean a clinician has all the correct information for the patient. And that could potentially delay or result in incorrect care being given to a patient. No, that's understandable and obviously really important as well. So if a patient came to the practice with more than one, H one NHS number, what should the practice do to rectify that? So notifying us via our online forms on the contact us page of the PCSE website is, is definitely the preferred approach because we've built that form with mandatory fields. So we, we're collecting as much information, well, the basic information, as much information in the additional information box that can be provided is all the better. Yeah, yeah I am going to run through that at the end of the presentation just to show people, because obviously we do reference the online inquiries form quite a lot through the presentation, I think, and some people call it contact us, some people call it inquiries forms. So I am going to show everybody where they can actually find the form at the end of the presentation, just in case there is any confusion around that. Thanks, Jamie. So how would we resolve a duplicate case then? So very similar kind of answer to confusions, really. So Again, PCSE only play a part in it in terms of gathering as much information as we can 
to provide evidence, if you will, to the National Back Office that the two NHS numbers definitely relate to the same person. That can be quite challenging times because there could be different dates of birth, different genders, different names, and they might need clarification of those. That, And that's just basically to avoid us merging two records together when it could actually be two different people, because that's a, another situation issue in itself. But once PCSE have got the information, we'll liaise with the National Back Office um, and they will merge the two NHS numbers together, provided they're satisfied that the two numbers do relate to the same individual. Thanks, Jamie. And again, I'm going to ask you, how long does it usually take for us to rectify a duplicate case? Um, so, yes, similar answer again. So we will aim to pick up any new cases that are raised to us within 10 working days. And provided we have all the information, we will log that with the National Back Office. We don't have control over their timescales, so... It depends how long MBO are taking at that moment in time to resolve the queries. Um, but once they do and they notify PCSE that the records have been merged, it would be quite quick that we go back to the practices and confirm confirm the correct the NHS numbers to use. That's great. Thank you. And I'm guessing this is this kind of the same as the confusion. But if you could just clarify how any common issues could be avoided, please, Jamie. Yeah, and I think it, I've sent quite a few questions in the in the Q and A section, and I, I think it could address some some issues here around overseas visitors as well, and um, to answer quite a lot of the, the queries. So, when patients are arriving from overseas, as part of migrant visas programs, they can pay a surge charge to kind of get an NHS number at their time. The the Home Office will allocate an NHS number to those patients, but it's allocated in the demographics they give at the time when they turn up to register at a GP practice they might provide slightly different details. And that might mean that the original NHS number they're allocated can't be traced and they'll be allocated a second NHS number. It's kind of a, a common known issue. And as I touched on earlier, if you do come across them, uh, raise them via the online form on the contact us page. But otherwise, it's again, keeping your contact details up to date, using NHS net email addresses where possible, because if we do need further information, and you've not necessarily notified PCSE of a duplicate, we can not only really exchange patient identifying information by NHS mail addresses. And again, provide as much information on that form as you can when patients enter the country, places of birth, any additional information, previous GP histories, all that kind of information. That's great. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, so we're now going to have a look at gender reassignment then. I'm still with you, Jamie. It's the next slide for you. So if you could just give us a brief overview of gender reassignments then. Now, just before you do, after this slide, we, we are going to run through some commonly asked questions. We did hold a webinar last year for patient registrations and I have pulled some of the frequently asked questions together. But yeah, Jamie, I'll hand it over to you. If you could just run through some of the key points with us, please. Uh, yes, certainly. So if, if a patient wishes to change their gender from female to male or male to female, they don't actually have to have undergone any sort of medical procedure to, to reassign their gender. It could just be they want to change their administered to gender on their record. There is no current age limit to this at the moment. But when a, when a patient approaches the practice and wishes to or expresses their want to, to change their gender, at present, current guidance kind of dictates that we need to allocate the patient a new NHS number and that's kind of to avoid any kind of discrimination to that patient um, should they present to a, an, another medical care provider and they've got only their latest information on the record. So when the patient does present at the, the practice we encourage a, a conversation with the patient to, to explain that process that they will be allocated a new NHS number in, in usual circumstances. And then to notify us of a gender assignment, again, it's the contact us form on the PCSE website. But like I say, we do mention the contact us form a lot, but I'll, I'll run through that later on for you. OK, so just looking at some of the common questions then. So these were kind of the key themes that we got coming through last year. So the first one being is, what if a patient doesn't want to change their gender on the system? Can they just change their title to say Mr or Miss, etc.? Um, so to the answer to one is yes, and that might be a slight contradiction to some people who have previously been told that's not possible. But during the course of the last year, the registrations functionality has been has been transitioned off an old system onto a new system, and it is now possible to have a title of Mister with a gender of female. Thanks, Jamie. And 
If the patient really wants to keep that NHS number, is that possible? So it is, yes. So the, the current guidance out there does kind of, as I said, stipulate that the NHS number has changed. But a patient can forego that right to change the NHS number. We do encourage that if that is the case, that the patient signs something in writing that's stored in the medical record just to prevent any kind of comeback on the practice, really, should previous names or genders get disclosed in error. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. And the next one. So how does changing gender affect current patient care? So I suppose if you've got a patient that comes in the practice and they're currently undergoing a lot of treatment, say at the hospital or at different practices, things like that. Do you think it'll be affected if they start changing the gender midway through any kind of treatment plans or anything? So, no, there, there should be processes in place that prevent impact to patient care. So whether that's at hospital who should be able to retrace for NHS numbers on spine and pick up the facts and transfer um, information over, that sh there should be local processes in place. OK, thank you. So the next question then, so what happens with the medical records that hold the patient's previous details? So I suppose that's kind of coming from a practice that have had a patient come in, they've requested to change the gender, but obviously they've got all the medical records that hold the previous gender with all the previous details. What would the practice need to do with those medical records, please, Jamie? So if the process goes through in full and the patient is allocated a new NHS number, the records under the old NHS number should be retained at the practice and a new Lloyd George will be sent out in the new details. And the practice will need to redact any information that relates to the, the previous identity and they can be transferred into the, the new Lloyd George envelope. And effectively, it's the same with the electronic records. It may be that they need to be printed out from the old record, redacted of any um, information that relates to the old identity and then rescanned onto the new record. That's fine. So when you say redact any information, is that just a case of removing any identifiable data of the previous gender? Yes, and potentially names. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And just linking to that question then. So with regard, so you mentioned that they'll get a new Lloyd George sent. Now, what will happen with the old Lloyd George? Do they need to send it back to PCSE or can they just securely destroy it with within like their practices um, recommendations to, to securely destroy anything? So that the, the outer envelope with the old identity can be securely destroyed. It doesn't need to be sent back to PCSE. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, then. So the next question is, what about non-binary patients? So what title needs to be used in these scenarios on our systems or the clinical system? So as I've kind of touched on the very first question that we had, our system now allows us to have titles that traditionally would conflict with a gender. So we can have a Mr. and a female, a Mr. and a male. We can also have no title now in the new system that we've moved to. So effectively, there are a number of titles that can be used for non-binary patients. Thank you. And one of the, another common question that we got through the last time we held the patient registrations webinar was around the title MX. And they were basically asking, What's it used for, essentially? And if you could answer that for me, please, Jamie. So, yes, the title MX can be used. And traditionally, on the system that we've moved away from now, we did use MX where we couldn't have a conflict of title and gender previously. Where agreed with the patient, we did use a title MX because that was kind of, it's not descriptive to a title. So we would use it in that situation. We no longer have that restriction now. So again, it's if a patient wants to be referred to as MX in a title, that's fine. A transaction sent through the GP links for us to change that. But PCSE don't use it as a, as a matter of course, and we won't change a patient's record to include that. Thank you, Jamie. I really appreciate you answering all those questions for me. OK, so looking at adoptions then. So... The first thing that we wanted to start with was just to kind of outline what the current process is for patients that have been adopted. Uh, yeah, so adoptions go through the, the family courts and they will approve the adoption of the child and replacement birth certificates will be issued. And this information will go to the, the GRO, which is the General Registry Office, and they inform the National Back Office of the child's adoption. And what the MBO do then, well, they will allocate an NHS number in the post-adoptive identity. 
for the patient and then they will attempt to trace the pre-adoptive NHS number for that patient. Again, touching on going back to duplicates a little bit, and that's to prevent duplicates being out there for the patients. So they'll attempt to find it and more often than not, they will find the pre-adoptive identity and they will invalidate that and a deduction will be sent to the registered practice of that NHS number. MBO will then inform PCSE of the new identity and the pre-adoptive identity and we will pass that on to the information to the practice via email. Thank you. Okay, so what is expected from the GP practice then when they are notified of an adoption? So the expectation is that when when MBO create the new post-adoptive NHS number, that patient isn't registered to the practice. So the the first expectation really is that the practice will generate a GP linked registration with that number to update the spine PDS to show that the practice is the registered practice of that patient. And then there's there's an expectation that the practice will work with other organisations that share the electronic record, such as local acute and community trusts, um, to update that information. Clinical records for the patient should remain intact and they should be held on the clinical system bearing the post-adoptive NHS number and details. Any paper Lloyd George or envelopes can be destroyed through the confidential waste process. And this is very similar to the gender assignment process in the PCSE once we process the registration under the new NHS number, we will send out a Lloyd George in the new details so that the paper records can be transferred across. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy. So what if my patient's been adopted, but the practice haven't received any notification? Or what do the practice do need to do if they've got a query about an adopted patient? So, yes, as I've touched on on the earlier slides, um, the, the National Back Office will do their best to try and identify the pre-adoptive record, but they won't necessarily always be able to identify identify it. So it, there could be cases where a practice is aware an adoption has taken place or is due to take place. And what we would do is ask practice to complete the online form, notify this and providing evidence um, that the child has been adopted. And then we can approach the National Back Office with that information and make them aware the adoption is. And that will facilitate them doing another trace and potentially finding the, the pre-adoptive NHS number. And they can then follow that process to invalidate the record and will then ask the practice to re-register in the in the, the post-adoptive NHS number. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Jamie. So we have come to the end of the adoption slide. Now going to look at patient removals and I'm going to rely on my colleague Alex to support with this one. We're going on to patient removals start with what are immediate removals so these are when there's been an incident at the GP practice but also it can sometimes be the patient home and it's where the police have had to be called and a request can be made to PCSE through email phone call or the online form and these are accessed within 24 hours but that time doesn't include weekends and bank holidays and sometimes we do need longer time if the rejections needed because we need more information to ensure that the request is received directly into the correct team and it contains all the correct information required for us to act them, the best way to do this is by going on the patient removals online form that's available on the contact us page of the PCSE website. And requests that do not indicate police involvement will require commissioner or ICB approval before being submitted to PCSE. And that also includes forms that aren't submitted within seven days of the incident and where the police have not been contacted by the practice within 24 hours of the incident. So for the patient, the patients who are removed immediately from their GP practice, they are allocated to the special allocation scheme. The providers of SAS provide primary care medical services to the patient until they feel there's no longer a risk to healthcare staff and at that point the patient is discharged from the scheme. I'll move on to eight day removals. So these types of removals are for when there's been a breakdown in the GP practice patient relationship and it can include verbally abusive behaviour and also missing appointments, also sometimes called DNAs. The practice should have warned the patient, preferably in writing, 
that were at risk of removal within the last 12 months. And that's unless there's specific reasons why this was not done, such as it's not practicable, or it would be harmful physically or mentally to do so, and would put practice staff at risk of harm. Practices do need to inform patients of the specific reasons why they are being removed, if at all possible. These requests, again, are actioned by PCSE within 24 hours. Again, doesn't include weekends or bank holidays. And to ensure the request is received directly into the correct team, again, please do use the online form on the Contact Us page of the PCSE website. So we have other types of removals as well. So any other deduction requests, including those below, this will be requested through your clinical system using the patient deduction tools. This includes death, embarkation, out of area. Please do provide the latest address in your GP messages when you're doing out of area deductions and also includes whereabouts unknown. Please do not use high security or any security control procedures when deducting the patients unless PCSE tell you to do so. It can really confuse the records there. And that's because deducting in this way it only removes the patient from a clinical system's active list. and It does not update the spine or PDS, some people call it. For FP69, these are flags that are set against patient records by PCSE, and that's when a letter is returned undelivered or no response has been received from a patient. These run six months, and at which point, if there's no new address or confirmation that the current address is correct is received, the patient is then going to be deducted. We also have removals at patient request. These should be in writing from the patient, and these are actioned as 14-day removals. Lovely. Thank you, Alex, for running yep. through that. OK, so we're now moving on to interchange management then. And supporting me with that, I've got Jamie again. So, again, could you just please let us know what we mean by an interchange management, please? Yes, so in interchange management is all around how the data is exchanged between spine and clinical system. And, and this is done via interchanges. So within those interchanges are messages and transactions. So all the registrations, amendments, deductions that practices are doing, and then anything that PCSE are doing. So if we're approving registrations, the approvals, any amendments that we've made, and any deductions as a result of patients being registered on the practice, they're all exchanged via messages and transactions that are contained within interchanges. So really, the, they play a vi vital part in ensuring that spine and clinical systems are kept aligned during registration events. So it's, it's vitally important that PCC manage the receipt of interchanges, make sure that they're being received in the correct format and that they're being received in sequential order. And this will make sure that patients are, um, details are being updated correctly. Okay, thank you, Jamie. So, would you just be able to explain what the importance of interchange management is, please? Yeah, so it's kind of, I've kind of got a, got a slide ahead there by a touch on the last slide, but it is, it's, it, it's making sure that all the data that is being sent by clinical systems is reaching Spine and PCSE are able to process that data and vice versa, all the data that Spine is send, sending out to clinical systems to update practice systems, that is being received and it's being processed accurately and that keeps uh, the PDS up to date. And that vitally important because PDS is used as the source for a global sum. So the calculation is done a quart quarterly for practices to pay their patients based on their registered population uses PDS data. And also health screening programs use PDS data for call and recall programs. So having that data on PDS accurate and up to date is vitally important for patients and practices. Great, thank you, Jamie. So we're now going to move over to list reconciliation. So again, Jamie, if you could help us with this one, could you just explain what list, list reconciliation is, please? Yes, so it's a, it's a data quality exercise that we that is used to compare data that's held on a clinical system against spine and PDS. 
And the kind of the initiator for the process is PCSE first in making a request to the practice to undertake one, although a practice can ask for a list reconciliation as well. But the key component is the practice providing a download of their patient information from the clinical system. Once PCSE receive that, we send that to the spine for comparison. And that does all kind of the legwork in terms of looking at the date of the practice supplied, um, checking the patient if they've registered on PDS or not. And then it will also check patients that register on PDS and see if there's an entry on the download the practice provided. Um, and this produces a number of reports. So you've got patients that are registered on one system and not the other. And then any patients have a, demo, a demographic difference, despite the fact that they're registered on both systems. PCSE will try and work through some of the demographic differences to see if PDS or the GP holds more up-to-date information and attempt to make updates where we can. But if we can't, we will have to query that back with the GP practice to make sure that the PDS holds the correct information. And same with the patients unregistered on different systems, we produce a report that is sent to practices. And again, the whole purpose of the process is to reduce clinical risk and ensure that practices are paid fairly for the patients that they're treating. Thank you, Jamie. So is there anything that the practice can do to SMART to support this benefit? Um, yes. So when PCSE make the initial request, uh, practices are contracted to support with list reconciliation data quality activities. So we request that the file is provided in 30 days of the request to reconcile. And then once we've completed the comparison exercise and returned the data reports to, to practices, again, we ask that within 30 days that, or as close to it that those can be returned. And that just maintains the integrity of the, the data because obviously the reconciliation is done at a point of time. So the data is only accurate at that point. So the kind of longer that it's left, some of that data may change and it makes it more challenging to ensure that the data is updated accurately. Lovely. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, so we are now moving on to list maintenance then. So could you please just run through and just explain what we mean by list maintenance? Yes, so this is another data quality check. So it's a, it's a second part of the data quality check in the PCSE do. And the purpose of this process is to try and ensure that patients are registered correctly and in the correct details. So there are a group of cohorts that PCSE are contracted to do. Um, so we will look at patients aged over 100 years of age, patients who've registered with the NHS for the first time having previously arrived for abroad in their 13th month of being registered with a GP, patients who live at addresses with eight or more registered residents, patients who have been students for more than four years, and then patients who are residents at an address that is recorded as demolished by the Royal Mail. And again, inflated GP list sizes impacts on global sum pay payments, and it's recognised that patients will move about informing their GP practice, and this is a kind of way of trying to capture them and ensuring that they're removed from the, the practice if they've kind of moved abroad or moved to a different address and need to register with a, a more local GP. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thanks, Jamie. Just making sure that all the lists are accurate, isn't it? Yes. Fantastic. OK, so I suppose the next question is, have we got any tips for the list maintenance process? Um, yes, so three of the five cohorts that I covered before have an initial step to contact the GP practice first. So whilst um, there could be a, a number of patients identified and cut quite large numbers in, in some practices, we do ask that practices respond to those lists as soon as possible. And with all the patients having a, a each spreadsheet has a code on it and we ask that the patients are, are given a code. And this will reduce the potential impact of patients being sent letters that they then may not respond to because what happens at the end of it, it will result in FP69 flags being sent for no response and then patients might unknowingly get removed from GP practice some months down the line and say that they've not received any, any letter and they actually have. Thank you, Jamie. Moving on to our records and I've got Joe supporting on this one. Hey, hey Joe. So, Hello. could you please, please, so kind, just to explain the what an RI code is, please? So, adding a res importantly, adding a residential institute co code or an RI code to a patient's record is the responsibility of the GP practice. 
Following the transition of registrations functionality from a legacy system previously as NHAS to new platform of PCRM, changes were made to this process. As part of the new process, there are now just two RI codes. V0, not to be confused with VO, is used to uh, use for flag patients who are living in currently living in care or residential homes or care facilities. And number two is Y0, which is used to flag a patient as a student. An RI flag can be added on a new registration or by amending an existing patient record. There is no validation on spine when a patient's record is flagged as being a student, but there is validation when a registration or amendment is received with care of residential RI flag of V0. Thank you. And would you be able to explain the PCSE process then, please? So the PCSE process is, it starts off with the fact that the spine holds a list of care homes via their, their postcodes. If a transaction is received into the spine with the V0RI code for care homes, an automated check is run to determine whether the patient's address is from the list of care homes via the postcode. Where no care home or residential home can be traced, a work item is created for, the P, uh, for PCSE to check. PCC will firstly check the address of the patient's record is correct and matches to PATH, more importantly. Once the address is corrected or confirmed correct, PCC will run the check again and see if any changes were made. Alternatively, PCC will check all the sources, importantly, such as CQC website, uh, to determine whether the patient's address actually qualifies as a care or residential home, which if they were not on the CQC, for example, there's a higher chance that we won't include the code, but if they are, if the res, uh, institution is registered on CQC, then they're more likely to receive the code. If confirmed, PCC will accept the transaction transaction with the RI code, or otherwise will be removed. Thank you. And then, I suppose, just looking at RI code queries, please. What if we've got any queries? What do they need to do? So, should PCC remove the RI code? And the practice dispute this. A query can be raised through the PCC inqui uh, inquiries form on contact us. If you believe there's discrepancy between the number of care home patients on your quarterly statements and those between those that are registered with your practice, firstly check if the patients are flagged correctly on the clinical system with the VZO RI code. If they are not, then you can amend the records, send it back through with the RI code. If they are, please contact PCSE through the inquiries form again through contact us and we will work with the practices to update the patient's record. Thanks for that, Joe. No problem. OK, so um, moving on to common queries then. Looking firstly at Oh, unacknowledged registrations. I believe this is with yourself again, Joe. If you could just kindly explain what these are, please. Uh, unacknowledged registrations. So these are registrations submitted by GP practice that have not been processed by PCSE. This could be because we never received the registration. So issues with interchange management, going back to previous slides with Jamie, how important that is. The rejected registration. So we've not, we've received the registration, but it wasn't actually processed because we rejected it. Um, and have received and processed the registration, but there was an issue processing the approval message on the clinical system, again, related to interchange management issues. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of registration received are processed within 30 minutes of them being submitted by practices. And PCSE aim to process the vast majority of the remaining registrations within three days. But if there is data quality issues, then it can take up to 10 days, depending on the variation of the data quality. If you have unacknowledged registrations in your clinical system older than 10 days, please email the registrations team providing the patient details and your practice code. And it's also helpful to include any transaction or interchange numbers taken from your clinical system to allow PCC to identify any errors much faster. No, that's great. Thanks, Joe. OK, so looking at an unmatched queries then. So an unmatched transaction is a transaction that Spine has sent to a clinical system um, and it can't be matched with any pay, patient or corresponding tra transaction on the clinical system. So a, a typical example is that a practice has sent a registration via GP links and that patient is showing unacknowledged. If a change is then made to that patient's record to approve the registration on the just on the clinical system using high security, which Alex touched on earlier, 
when PCSE then process that registration, the transaction sent back with an approval in to tell the clinical system that PCSE had processed it. But if there is no unacknowledged transaction waiting, it will go into the unmatched um, part because there isn't, there's nothing to, to, to match against. So it could also be an identifier that there is an issue with system to system messaging. So what we ask is that practices kind of keep an eye on unmatched transactions, raise them to PCSE regularly. Um, so you don't have to raise them kind of every day, maybe weekly or every couple of weeks, just check them and make them raise them to PCSE because PCSE's process is that we will take the transaction number, run it through our systems, identify what was that transaction was related to, and then provide back to the practice the patient details. And you can make sure that the transaction either doesn't need updating or you'll need to make amendments to your clinical system to update the transaction. Again, it's all about keeping the clinical system in line with the details that are held on spine PDS for patients. That's great, thank you. Um, moving on to high security and security control procedures. I'm back with you, Joe, for this one. If you could just explain what we mean by that, please. So for high security and secure security control procedures, this function only updates practice clinical systems and no GP links messages are sent to the spine or the PDS. This can result in the clinical system and spine becoming misaligned and impact the practice targets and finances. Uh, and the functionality should only be used when requested by PCSE to correct a discrepancy between clinical systems and the spine. For patients deducted as deceased in error, if a patient is deducted as deceased in error, please do not re-register them in immediately. First contact PCSE, providing your practice code and details of the patient. And PCSE will raise a case with MBO or the National Back Office, requesting that the death details and status are removed from the spine. And then PCSE will then advise your practice to re-register the patient when suited and PCSE will be unable to process a registration for a patient who has a death status on their spine currently. That's great, thank you Joe. Okay so we are coming up to the end of the presentation so we've gone through all the content that we wanted to go through with regards to the various areas and aspects of patient registrations. I'm now just going to quickly run through some PCSE support and guidance. So like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we do talk about a lot about the contact us form and how you want to raise a query and things like that and main contact. So I'm just going to run through a couple of slides of that. So how to raise a genuine query then? So I suppose we really ask before you do just jump on and raise a query with us, do have a look on the PCC website to see if the information is already there. We've got a wealth of information available. We've got lots of user guides. We've got a PCC YouTube channel that has lots of videos on there. And yeah, we've just got an absolute wealth of information, which I am going to go into a bit more detail just to let you know where you can find things. So rather than raising a query and having to wait for a response, sometimes it may just be more efficient just to pop on the PCC website and see if you know your answers in an FAQ, for example, because we do try and create those through the calls that come through to our customer contact centre. However, we know that it's not always the case. You know, you, you will need to contact us at some point. Now, if you do need to do that, then we do ask that you use the PCSE contact us form, which is on the PCSE website, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And yet, yeah, alternatively, the, the registrations team have provided an email address that you could also use. But when you do contact us, we just ask that provide as much detail as possible. So any practice codes or error codes, any patient information that we might need that we'll be able to resolve that query in one go. Because if, if you submit an inquiry to us and it's missing a piece of information, it's just going to mean that the registrations team are going to have to contact you again just to seek that further information so they can rectify your query. So I've put some videos together just to show you whereabouts all the information is that I've been talking about. If you'd like to find more information about patient registrations and how we can support you with your services, simply head over to the PCC website and select services. And then scroll down to patient registrations. In this area, you'll see that it gives you an overview and there's a link to the guide to registrations. You can find out how to locate an NHS number. And then we have links to our frequently asked questions. 
Further down the page, you can see that we have a link for our patient registrations resources. And within this area, it's easy access to the frequently asked questions and all the user guides that will be able to support you with patient registrations at the practice. So that was just a quick demonstration on where you can find further information. And I've also put another video together to show you about the contact us form, also known as the inquiries form. If you need to contact PCSE using our online inquiry form, select the contact us tab in the blue banner. And here you'll see it will give you the option for all the service lines you could submit an online inquiry form. Head over to patient registrations. And again, it will give you various links to our tools available, such as the frequently asked questions, the registrations page, and a link to all the patient registration user guides. To find your online inquiry form, simply scroll down. And here you will see they have been placed into different areas. So you have patient registrations for GP practice only. This would be for any patient registrations, general inquiries. We have list cleaning for patients only, an area for adoptions and gender reassignment, an area for duplicate NHS numbers and confusions, and an area for patient removals. If you have a general inquiry for patient registrations, select this button. And here you will see you have the option to submit a new patient registration inquiry or follow up on an existing patient registration inquiry. When selecting the form, you'll see that it wants you to provide lots of various details. So please include as much detail as possible, such as your practice code and any patient information that we will need to follow up on your inquiry. Once all your details have been completed, simply select Submit at the bottom. So as you can see on the tiles shown on the website, we just ask that when you are submitting an inquiry for us um, to PCSE with regards to a patient registration query, that you are just selecting the correct tile. Doing so just ensures that the inquiry goes directly to the team that need to process the query and you'll find that it will just go straight to that team and then they will be able to look at that for you rather than our indexers having to work out which team it needs to be sent to. But like I say, have a look at the, the frequently asked questions on the website. We do have lots on there and um, we will be looking at the questions from today's session and incorporating some of those answers within the FAQs if we do feel there is a bit, bit of a gap. But yeah, like I say, we do have a wealth of information available for you. So just to quickly touch on the main contact then, because I know this has been mentioned quite a bit throughout the webinar that PTC will liaise with the main contact at the practice. So I just wanted to explain a couple of things about it while you've, we've got you on the call. So one of the main things is just making sure that this contact is up to date and current. Now, the main reason for that is, is because every practice can only have one main contact assigned to them. So that means essentially if that email address is wrong and the patient registrations team need to contact the practice at that email address, chances are that message isn't getting through to the people that need it at the practice. So just make sure that, you know, you the person you've got who's the main contact at the practice is the current person that you want to be dealing with those emails and things. Now, having said that, the main contact is also used to manage permissions and roles for those that are using PCSE online. So the main contact will manage those that are ordering supplies and managing the medical record service in PCSE online. Now, there are three different user administrators that you can have at the practice. Now, you've got the main contact being one, You've got one for performer list roles and you've got one that is the user administrator for any pensions and payments related services. Now, the main contact is a little bit different than the performer list and the payments and pensions user administrator because they cannot assign another person the, the main contact role. So if you don't have a main contact at the practice or you need to have that changed, you will need to contact PTSC directly. Now, you can do so by sending an email to the portal inquiries team and I'll pop the email address on the slide for you if you want to take note of that. Now, if you do need to contact us to let us know if you need to change that, 
We just ask that you do provide your organisation code and the name and the email address of the person that you want to be the new main contact, just so we've got all the information needed so we can action that for you. OK, so I did mention that I just wanted to touch on the different roles in PCSE Online and it's just mainly rather than I'm not going to go into every single role and what that role allows you to do. I just more want to explain what the user administrators are responsible for. So as you can see, it's been split up into three separate areas and each user administrator is only responsible for their area. So for supplies and logistics, the user administrator is the main contact and they are just responsible for assigning the roles for anybody that needs to order supplies for the practice and anybody that's managing the medical records at the practice. And then looking at the middle column, you'll see that it's for performance services and the user administrator is the PL organisation user administrator. Now, the only role that they can assign is the PL practice manager, and that would be for anybody that needs to approve any perform list changes that come through. So if you've got a GP that's leaving or joining your surgery, etc. Now, where we do see, see a little bit of confusion is, is that if you've got one person that's a user administrator, say you're the PL organisation user administrator, and you need to assign a role for somebody to be able to watch and some work involving pensions and payments, as the PL user administrator, you won't be able to assign any other roles to any other of those areas. So it would need to be the user administrator for pensions and payments if they wanted to assign those roles. So just like I say, it's just a brief overview. We do have this information in, within the user management guide on the PCSC website. It is a clickable, it's an interactive guide, so you can click on each of the roles and it explains in a bit more detail on what you need to do and what they can do once they've got that role. So I hope that has helped a little bit. And I just wanted to let you know as well that we do have the PCSE YouTube channel. Um, I know I did receive quite a few emails before the webinar started asking, you know, is the webinar being recorded today? Yes, it is being recorded and we will be including that on the PCSE YouTube channel sometime next week. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for everybody attending and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon.